Let's move to Frankfurt School. In the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, we see one of the longest and the most famous traditions of Marxism. This tradition of understanding human society not only strictly developed Marxist ideas, but moved the focus to critique, rather than the political utopia invention. Let's cover briefly the history of its institutionalization. To begin with, the Frankfurt School grew out of the Institute of Social Research, which was founded in 1923 at the University of Frankfurt by Felix Weil a political scientist with a passion for Marxism. One of the major purposes of the Institute was to study the dynamics of social change. First years, Karl Grunberg served as a director and stressed the historical context to research. Max Hochheimer served as director for the years from 1930 to 1958. Horkheimer stressed the indisciplinary nature of the Institute's research program. When National Socialism came to power, the Institute fled to Geneva and to New York, being attached to the Department of Sociology at Columbia University. In 1941, the Institute relocated to California. During Second World War, then members of the Institute settled in various parts of the United States. In 1949, Horkheimer and Adorno returned to Germany, and in 1951, they re-established the Institute of Social Research with Horkheimer as a director. Marcus, among other members, remained in the United States. The Institute disbanded in 1969, but its influence continued in the work of Jürgen Habermas, representing the second wave of critical theory. Let's discuss in, in detail Adorno and Horkheimer. We start from the Adorno and Horkheimer ideas. Adorno and Horkheimer view capitalist society, culture, industry as an aspect of enlightenment, has betrayed itself by allowing instrumental logic to take over human social life. This idea was elaborated in their book Dialectic of Enlightenment. According to Adorno and Horkheimer, culture industry is the main phenomenon of late capitalism, which encompasses all products and forms of light entertainment. Dialectic of Enlightenment Culture Industry all these forms of popular culture are designed to satisfy the growing needs of mass capitalistic consumers for entertainment. Products of the culture economy take the appearance of artwork but are in fact dependent on industry and economy, meaning they are subjected to the interest of money and power. All products of the culture industry are designed for profit. This means that every work of art is turned into a consumer product and is shaped by the logic of capitalistic rationality. Art is no longer autonomous, but is rather a commodified product of the economic relations of production. The main argument of them is that the commodification of culture is the commodification of human consciousness. Adorno and Horkheimer assert that the culture industry eradicates autonomous thinking and criticism serving to preserve the reigning order. Let's move on. Let's discuss Adorno and mass society. Theodore Adorno led his personal life of argumentation focusing on the following aspects of popular culture and mass society. Adorno was deeply skeptical of instrumental reason, viewing it as a potentially totalitarian and deeply damaging of both internal human relations as well as the relation between man and nature. In this critique, Adorno does not suggest an anti-science stance, but questions the assumption that we can totally know our world through instrumental reason alone. For Adorno, the totalitarian nature of instrumental reason manifests itself in a limited perception. This allows manipulating public opinion with the aid of standardized popular culture. Let's discuss Adorno and popular culture. Adorno was also a composer. Hence, his focus in culture was connected to the jazz popularity. That is why a lot of his ideas are illustrated with examples from the development of music sphere. Overall, idea is the following. The increasing totalized nature of cultural hegemony is a direct result of the industrialization of culture. The latter assumes its total administration by the establishment. Establishment uses standardized products in order to achieve a kind of universal language to transmit through the culture particular ideology and gain the profit. Let's move on. Let's discuss critique of popular culture. Besides Adorno, Walter Benjamin also focused on culture in the 20th century. 
Benjamin's insight here is that each human sensory perspective is not completely biological or natural. It is also historical. Benjamin sees the transformations of art as an effect of changes in the economic structure. Historically, works of art had an aura, which he defines as an appearance of magical or supernatural force arising from their uniqueness. The aura includes a sensory experience of distance between the reader and the work of art. The aura has disappeared in the modern age because art has become reproducible. The aura is an effect of a work of art being uniquely present in time and space. A reproduced artwork is never fully present. If there is no original, it is never fully present anywhere. However, the loss of aura seems to have been both positive and negative effects for Benjamin. On the one hand, he sees the aura, authenticity and uniqueness of works of art as fundamentally connected to their insertion in a tradition. The reproduced work of art is completely detached from the space of tradition. It loses the continuity of its presentation and appreciation. On the other hand, responses to art became increasingly collective, where the individual reaction is produced or compounded by the reaction of the entire audience. Earlier works, even when exhibited in galleries, did not lead to an organized mass response. Adorno and communication. Let's go back to Adorno. His figure is particularly important for us because he explicitly defines communication as the form of interaction in the social world. First, we need to separate cognition and communication. Cognition is the production of new individual knowledge and the reproduction of individual knowledge. When the former creates knowledge, the latter organizes social interaction and establishes people's relation to each other and the objective world per se. Cognition's objects are nature and society. Individuals do not always have to communicate with other humans in society to form and reproduce thoughts. They can merely observe and thereby gather experiences that form and reproduce knowledge. Individuals also do not have to work in order to cognize. They do not have to create social use values out of nature and culture that satisfy general social needs. Adorno shows that there is a dialectic of the social and the individual and the objective world in the communication process. Communication is the symbolically expressed social relation that allows the individual A to relate to others O and others individuals O to relate to A and other individuals as they others. Complicated? No, not really. They together and individually relate to the objective world that consists of nature and society.